Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon Father. Father. <laughs> Who's glad it's Friday? Great. Um, yeah, this second row, pick the person you like the least and kick it. Just kidding. <laughs> Good job. What's your name? Sebastian. Sebastian. Blessed are you among teenagers. <laughs> um, who was here when I was here pre-pandemic? That was a long time ago. It was psychologically an eon ago. Um, great. How many of you are freshmen? How many of you are sophomores? How many of you are juniors? Among you, are there seniors? Like two seniors? How are there only two seniors? <laughs> it's a long story. Okay. So it's complicated. Great. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and filling all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, Come and dwell within us. Cleanse us from all stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So the title of today's talk is one I have never seen before nor heard of, but I've come to enjoy it. It is called How to Discern the Love of God in Your Life. And in a, a number of ways, right, the love of God is very obvious. It's a kind of, we've been speaking it to you since you were in first grade, um, things like that. And yet, at the same time, the love of God can be among the most elusive things in the spiritual life. How many of you deal with Catholic guilt? Nice. Who can give me a decent definition of Catholic guilt? You will not be made fun of. Good. So implied in that scenario, it's like when your mom goes in adoration chapel, says, do you want to come? Right. The the implicit premise in there is what I'm doing is far holier and superior to whatever you're doing on your cell phone or on the couch or whatever. Would you like to come? And then you take an inventory of your desires. Right. Either you've prayed sufficiently for the day or you're in a slothful period of time and you don't really want to pray or you want space from mom, and you're like, no. And then you grapple with the ever-present should, right? I should go pray. I should go be with my mom. I should go do the holier thing, right? True? And so Catholic guilt is this reign of shoulds that imp impose themselves on our moral life, and actually, we'll begin over time if, should, if the, the royal should is the thing that rules in your spiritual life the most, it'll actually, over time, even warp your passions. It'll change your kind of relationship with uh, other people, with God, things like that. Now, if you were saying to a second grader or a first grader, you should go to the adoration chapel, that's a perfectly acceptable thing to say, right? At your age, holding to a lofty ideal of, Hitting up adoration, going to confession, is something that we all should be doing, right? But there is a deeper reason for which we do everything in the Catholic faith. And behind every should is an opportunity of love. 
And so when we talk about discerning the love of God in your life, we're going to break that down. And we're going to come to the conclusion that I'm already giving you from the outset, that everything that we do, the best reason for which we do it is the sake of love. Not because your uber Catholic rosary wielding mother told you to. <laughs> but don't tell her I said that. So, I'm going to give you a quote. I'd like one line to rest on you. I'd like you, I'd like you to figure out which line resonates with you. <clears throat> Nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in a quite absolute final way. What or who you are in love with, what seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you will do with your evenings, how you will spend your weekend, what you read, whom you know, and what breaks your heart and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love. Stay in love. And it will decide everything. Fall in love. Stay in love. And it will decide everything. Discernment of of the love of God is going to be very important for your spiritual life. You're at, especially you juniors and quasi-seniors, whoever you people are, <laughs> everyone's asking you this question that's probably becoming a pain in your life of, so what colleges are you thinking about? What are you going to be doing with your future? And that might arouse anxiety. It might arouse uncertainty. It might expose the fact that you're avoiding doing certain things, whatever that is, right? You and I have a lot of plans that we're supposed to be making for the intermittent future, for the future down the road. But it's possible to be doing the right things for the wrong reasons. It's possible to go to college just because your mom and dad said you're going to college. And if you go, you can still do all the exterior actions of study, of cramming, of going to class, and you can avoid true learning. The first year of seminary, seminary here in the Archdiocese of Denver is generally seven years long. And we have what's called the spirituality year. The spirituality year is the first year of seminary and in that year, we take classes, but get no grades. We take classes, but we get no grades. And oh, the type A people hate it. The ones that have learned academic performance over and above learning are like, why would I take a class if I'm not going to get a little mangy letter at the end of the semester? If I can't take a percentage and show what I've done with it. The beauty of how the spirituality year is set up for us seminarians is it's to combat a lot of things in our own life. And so we give up cell phones for the entirety of the year so that we have true FaceTime and not Apple FaceTime. We enter into deep periods of silence they send us away on poverty immersion to places of extreme difficulty where we're tempted to just fix. If only we fixed this program or this building or whatever, then poverty or whatever would resolve itself. They throw us into a lot of impossible scenarios. And at the end of the day, we don't affect a lot of change. But the purpose of the majority of 
the spirituality here is that we learn to grow in love. There's a number of different ways of describing love. Some of you are currently playing footsies right now as an expression of your love. I got eyeballs. Love is the reason that we do everything in the Christian life. Love is what primarily motivates someone to give his or her life over to holy matrimony to priesthood, to taking Jesus seriously. Love is a really basic thing of human nature. And you may have heard classical definitions to love is to will the good the other, of the other. Have you guys gone through the four loves with C.S. Lewis? So there are four kinds of love in Greek. Philia, which is a love of friendship. Storge, which is a love of family loyalty. Eros, which is a love of desire. And agape, which is a sacrificial kind of love. How might a love of friendship apply to the love of God? Go ahead and answer. How might a love of friendship, philia, apply to God? Beautiful. So we want to know him, so you kn- um, to know and to understand. Um, have any of you been to a Taylor Swift concert? There are two boys here that are unwilling to admit that. Just kidding. <laughs> um, I always pick on Taylor Swift because she does this thing that really ticks me off. And she, at the end of her concerts, um, she just like looks into the crowd with like mascara, tears, or whatever. And she says, oh, I love you all so much. But you cannot love someone that you don't know. She doesn't even know how many people are there, right? And she doesn't even know how psychopathic they all are. (laughs) You can't love someone that you don't know. You can have benevolence. You can have goodwill towards someone that you don't know. But an actual form of friendship, you don't have that form of love with someone whom you don't know. Most languages have two ways of saying the word to know. Conozco and um, saber in Spanish. Conetra and savoir in French. Chire and uh, conoscere in Latin. And these two forms of knowledge, one is a kind of a data form of knowledge. I know facts, I know realities. A second form of knowledge is the knowledge of the complexities of a person. It's really beautiful. I was studying it abroad in Spain at some point. And I picked up on the fact that in the Spanish language, you say that Yo conozco a esta ciudad. I know this city. But you use the same verb as you do with people as with cities. And what it's implying is you're familiar with the complexities of a city. Its streets, the culture, you know what it's like. Go ahead and close your eyes right now. If you're chewing gum, just let it rest under your tongue. If your neighbor is elbowing you, do not turn the other cheek and do not elbow back. If I asked you if you know God in this second form of knowledge, are you familiar with the complexities of God? Do you know God in a personal way? If God were to love you, 
right here, right now, and show his love for you, do you even know how he would go about doing that? I don't care for how many of you that is the case. I would like it to be all of you. But the truth is, just because you go to Catholic school does not mean you are familiar with who God is. Even if you go to a small traditional school as Our Lady of Victory. You can open your eyes. What does it mean to have family loyalty with God? Story guy. Go ahead and take a shot. Good. Beautiful. So we, he's our father and we have to listen to what he says. So did he structure reality so that we have to do exactly what he makes us do? No. So how is it actually an expression of love living out of family loyalty? Are you guys able to disobey God? Yeah. Is your dog or your cat or your guinea pig or your goldfish at home, are they able to disobey God? No. Hmm. If they're not able to disobey God, are they able to obey God? Not in the truest sense of obey. They just exist according to their nature in a vat of existence, and they just keep doing what they do. So a dog or a fish or a hamster can't actually truly show God love of God, correct? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Whereas you and I are able to demonstrate God by living in family loyalty, by living according to the morality of the church. But because you're afraid of your mom, at this point, it still might be the case. But if fear of your mom is the only thing that's keeping you Catholic, you won't stay Catholic in college. There are some for whom their moral life takes flight because they realize that the moral life is lived for love. To choose the right thing, to do the good that a human ought to, the royal should, if it's actually elevated by love, then there's something really beautiful there. Then actually, my life has a certain peace, a joy. It makes sense. The fruits of the Holy Spirit are actually a part of my life. And people who display the fruits of the Holy Spirit really like who they are. That's another thing that your generation generally lacks. And again, just because you have intact homes and you go to Catholic school doesn't mean you like who you are. Teenage years are wonderfully awkward years filled with deep valleys of insecurity. And it's figuring out what are you good at? How bad do you smell if you don't put on deodorant? Who do you like? What does it feel like to have your heart broken? These are beautiful complexities of this age. And you have, just as you had a few years ago, especially you boys, as your like feet grow out of proportion to the rest of your body and you trip over yourselves. So too, that's happening emotionally. And it generally happens between now through age 26 when brain plasticity stops happening. But you're discovering that you have capabilities and capacities of love, which also means doing the right thing either because I'm afraid of getting trouble or because I have in some way in my life experienced the love of God and it means something. And I want my life to mean something. Eros, the love of desire. Eros can have a sexual component to it, I won't lie. 
And sex is a really beautiful thing, especially in the context of marriage, where God designed it. And yet, sex is not the only expression of eros. Eros is a love of, in- of intense desire and longing. If you are that person that admitted to yourself that you don't yet know God or are not yet familiar with God, have you experienced a longing to know him? Surely you've seen someone else in your life, a teacher, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, even a friend, who's actually really been touched in prayer, and they display it in the manner of their life. If you see that goodness on display in the lives of others, do you long for that? Do you have a desire? Do you seek to love God to desire him all the more? And then the fourth love, agape, a sacrificial love. This one tends to be kind of most front and present in our minds when we're in churches, because why? Go ahead and say what your fingers just said. Uh, Jesus. <laughs> right? Because in every faithful Catholic church, we put up a crucifix, which is a display of God's sacrificial love for man. We all know the Bible verse, so God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. that God shows his love for us through undergoing pain. And some of you are at a point now where you realize that you can actually show others love as well by undergoing pain, by staying up later with someone who's having a hard time, by sacrificing in some way to make a friend feel better, whatever's going on. And then it'll come at a personal cost because you like your sleep or you like your comfort, whatever it is. When you have control over your calendar in college or wherever you go hereafter, you'll be able to sacrifice at least one out of 160 hours a week to show up at church on Sundays if that's what you desire. Now, if I got, gave you a dollar sixty-eight and asked for one penny back, you'd probably have no problem with it. And yet, there are plenty of people who consider themselves Christians or even Catholics who don't even make that one-hour sacrifice of Mass on Sunday. Do you think of that moment in the Mass where the priest says, pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable? Do you just rattle off the response? May the Lord extend the sacrifice in your hand for the Lord of his name for our good and good all his holy church. Or do you show up to Mass with a sacrifice, with something that was hard that week? Do you offer it to the Lord and say, Lord, this thing that's going on in my life, this thing that I carry, this thing that you gave me, in a really awesome and beautiful and really funny way, Day one of Catholic school, I was so poorly behaved, third, fourth, and fifth grade. I was living in Knoxville, Tennessee at the time. My parents stuck me in Catholic school. And on day one, I showed up to have my picture taken. And I got my very first pimple on my nose. And then I learned, apparently, how much I cared about how I looked. And then I had horrendous acne from sixth grade until like probably middle of freshman in college. It was this burden that I carried because people would judge me on how I looked, on acne or whatever. And I would constantly either give that back to God or be really ticked at God for allowing me to have such gross acne. We all have stuff that we don't like about ourselves. And most of it we can't actually change. Some bodily or facial feature that we wish were different. Something in our personality, whatever it is. Whatever that thing is, 
Are you familiar with the complexity of yourself? Do you know yourself? And if you do, and you still don't like that part of yourself, do you offer it back to God as a sacrifice? Say, Lord, I give this back to you that you may deal with it. I realized later on in life, one of the beauties of having been celestially struck with acne is it pounded out any bit of vanity in my life. I struggle with plenty of sins, but I pretty much don't care what I look like. And that's a really awesome and beautiful and freeing thing, and it gives me an extra 25 minutes in the morning while everyone else is freaking out in front of the mirror. I get to sleep more the rest of my life because I don't freak out about my face. But more and more deeply than that, I came to love who I was even at a time where I wasn't totally acceptable to myself. And offering that on the altar whenever I went to Mass, Lord, I hate my, I hate my acne. Please take it from me and please take whatever it's attached to. Whatever it is you don't like about yourself, and we all have it, have you ever offered it up in Mass? Have you ever allowed the Lord to sacrificially apply the merits of his most precious blood, shed for love of you, shed for desirous love of you, to apply to parts of your life that you think are ugly, you think are stupid, that you tend to make fun of yourself for as a real social self-defense because you hope no one else will bring it up. To have the love of God in your life is utterly powerful. Okay. Don't say anything. Go ahead and stand up and stretch. I know you're in a church, but you can go ahead and acknowledge the fact that you have arms and legs. Go ahead and sit back down. So funny enough, right, discerning the love of God in your life, if you go through the catechism, you will see exactly zero entries on this. In fact, if you go through the catechism, here's what comes up. The discernment of charisms. What's a charism in the life of, a church, of the church? Well done. Right? And so the Franciscans have a charism of service of the poor. Missionaries of charity have a charism of, of service to the poorest of the poor. Uh, Jesuits teach, or they teach, um, whatever it is, right? And so you have the Holy Spirit that's pouring out charisms on religious orders, and then you and I have personal charisms, gifts that the Lord gives to us. And so the discernment of our charisms, what has the Lord given me, what has he given you, that's pretty important to know. But just because you know what you're good at, even God-givenly good, doesn't mean you have love. The next thing that the Catechism talks about is the discernment of life through a spiritual director. So if you've ever gone to confession and you just like vomited out this whole big thing, and then the priest helps you through it, that would be kind of a discernment of a path forward amid whatever trial you have going on. Then it talks about discernment of trials, which would be its own personal thing. So that would be, do you know where you're tempted? You and I are pretty good about figuring out where we sin or how we sin. We do that every time we go to confession. But do you know the two steps before when you sin? Are you able to deter determine when you're bored and then when you might do something stupid on the internet? Are you able to determine when you're insecure and when you might feel like speaking poorly about someone else to push them down to falsifiably elevate yourself? You and I are not very good at discerning our temptations of realizing what they are and then coming to an understanding of what to do about them. And at the same time, the love of God 
might impel us to avoid our temptations, but that's still not discernment of the love of God. Then we have the discernment of earthly goods and how to use them. That's a specific gift of the Holy Spirit. Does anyone know which one? Pardon? Prudence would be a virtue, and that would govern, but in terms of a gift of the Holy Spirit, self-control would be a fruit of the Holy Spirit and not a gift of the Holy Spirit, but thank you. Keep trying. Wisdom is seeing things as God sees them, which is part of it, but that's a bit more of a meta gift of the Holy Spirit. Fear of the Lord or piety is recognizing the debt that we have towards God, family, country. Temperance. Not the same. Temperance is a virtue by which we moderate goods and food. Counsel is a mode of practical knowledge of giving to others, but not primarily fortitude is endurance in hard and difficult things. <laughs> Understanding is coming to a greater um, depth of knowledge of the scriptures and revealed and divine revelation. Uh, love. love is chief of all theological virtues, but not the one. Knowledge. Bing, bing, bing. So the gift of knowledge is is literally knowledge, but the know-how to use earthly goods in such a way as not to be bogged down by them, but that they may be used to profit you for salvation unto the kingdom of heaven. The gift of knowledge. And so discernment of how to use your smartphone, how to use your allowance, how to use your uh, Irish setter dog at home, or whatever you have at your disposal, for the kingdom of heaven. That's an interesting gift to pray for. That's another kind of discernment, not discernment of the love of God. There's discernment of the state of life and activity. What might that be referring to? A discernment of the state of life. Like vocation. What is the Lord calling me to? Marriage? priesthood, consecrated single life, religious life. Then there's also, lastly, discernment of popular piety in the religious sense. And that's something that generally the Vatican does in terms of vetting what are new movements in the life of the church. Then we have, and this is not in the catechism, what's called the discernment of spirits. Are you familiar with this term, discernment of spirits? What are they primarily relate? What what's the primary object of discernment of spirits? What are we discerning? Great. So the good spirit and the bad spirit, and which ones to obey. What I'd like you to do. I'm going to give you five minutes. We're just going to have five minutes of quiet before we finish up the talk. And what what I'd like you to do is just discern now. Where are you at in your walk with Christ? We are three-fifths, maybe four-fifths of the way through this talk. And it's important for you to just take one or two things that I've said, allow it to sink in, and then we will return back to love. Okay? Please do not distract. The work of discernment is difficult because it takes time, it takes energy, it takes space of mind. And so you either did one of three things in that time given to you just now. You either tried to remember one or two things that I said and sought how they might apply to your life. Or you started and you tried to begin to discern at least some outcome of what I've said so far. 
and then you got sidetracked because of proximity to your best friend or whatever else. Or from the very beginning, you're like, no, this is too hard. I can't deal with silence. It's a Friday afternoon. I'm not trying. But then realizing that you can't misbehave because three of your instructors are sitting behind you and staring at you, you just kind of shut down your body, went to sleep, did your own other thing, and that's fine. The beauty is you have freedom. But again, if you were that third individual and you tuned out, you checked out, you didn't even try, then this is a wake-up call to you that whoever is faithful in the small things has the capacity to be faithful in the big things. So when you're given five minutes of time, even in the, the not most ideal of circumstances, you either use it well, try to use it well, or you don't. And the beauty is very few people can tell which it was for you. But God knows. Now you shouldn't just use it well. Why? Because God knows and he sees and you should. And Catholic guilt's going to kick in. And if you don't, then you go to hell. Hell should never be the motive for doing good things in the Christian life. It should be for the sake of love. And so if you were that kid who, when I said, do you, do you know God? Are you familiar with the complexities of God? Do you love God? And you, didn't, you couldn't really come up with a yes in your own heart? That's something. You might just bring that up in your next confession. Father, I don't really know what it means to love God. If you didn't even try during your time of discernment of what's going on in your own heart, whether you're in consolation or desolation, again, it might be because you don't fully know God the way that you want to. Keep this in mind because you can go to any one of your teachers and say, teach me how to pray. You can go to any priest. You can look up at my email. I'm at the crazy parish of our Lord's most precious blood. I'm Father Dana. You can find my email. You can go to your own parish priest, wherever you're at. And you can say, I don't know how to pray. And he will not think less of you just because you go to Our Lady of Victory, that really cool, awesome, ultra-trad school, and you don't know how to pray. There are priests who have not been taught how to pray or who pray really poorly. And so just because you're a priest doesn't mean you pray well. Just because you're a Catholic school teacher or a Catholic school student doesn't mean you pray well. Are any of you Lord of the Rings geeks here? (laughs) There we go. What does Gandalf say when Frodo says, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had ever happened. Do you remember? Go ahead and stand up. So that your geekiness may shine forth before all. All we have to do is to choose what to do with the time that's been given to us. What's your name? Thank you, Luke. Well done. All you have to do is choose what to do with the time that's been given to you. Here you are, freshman, sophomore, junior, or quasi-senior, and you get to choose what to do with the rest of your life. And your parents have some stake in the outcome, but my friends... If love is not part of the reason you're going to do whatever you're going to do, it's not worth doing. If I can be somewhat frank with you at this stage of the game, 
Uh, I have, uh, I'm the oldest of three boys, my middle brother, Alexander. Um, he and I went, he went, we went to two different high schools because we did not get along. And he was far smarter than I was. Um, and uh, I, he went to Columbia University in New York. And he got a bachelor's and a master's degree in four years and rode on the rowing team and had a girlfriend, which meant that the kid did not sleep for four straight years. Then he got out and worked on Wall Street, started making $100,000 a year as a 22-year-old. Uh, he worked on a financial inventories desk where $3 billion passed through his desk every week that he processed, whatever. But my brother died of alcoholism this past year. He saw it worldly success in everything. And he was really good at doing things the way the world did it. He knew Jesus, at least he knew about Jesus. He would never really let me talk about Jesus to him. But he started to have anxiety. And he started to deal with his anxiety with drinking. And it wasn't alcohol that killed him. I mean, biologically, yes. Alcohol destroyed his liver, and he stopped living. But in the case of my brother, it was a sense of independence, self-sufficiency. I don't want to depend on anyone for help. I don't want to need help. And in not wanting to need help, he never reached out for help. And in never reaching out for help, he never got better. My brother didn't know how to love very well. For him, love was a scary thing. It was a hard to define thing. It involved a risk. Because if you open yourself up to love, you also open yourself up to being hurt. So he played it safe. He was going to do the money thing. And he ended up passing away. Of the 550 people that were at his funeral, not a single one of them came from New York City. Not his ex-wife, not any of his college friends, not anyone that he worked with. But 40 of my priest brothers came. They didn't even know my brother. People from five different parishes that I had been assigned to came to my brother's funeral. My brother's funeral was a really funny thing because those who showed up to pray for him were those that had learned to love. Those who had experienced what does Christ's love mean? How does it apply to them? And how can they gather around a hurting family? In these small tests that I've given you just today, how do you spend your time? What do you do with your interior life? The question of all these is, how do you go about the love that God has given you the capacity for? Catholic guilt is no reason to continue practicing the faith but it's for the sake of love alone that God came to save us and that you and I say yes to him if we choose to. Love is one of the only things that makes life make sense. But in a very funny way, love does not remove the pains of the world. It does not fix all of your problems. And so what does discernment of the love of God mean? I think after all the things that I've said that it's not, the discernment of the love of God is being here, present, now. The love of God does not exist in the past. Yes, God loved you in the past. The love of God does not exist in the future. God won't love you once you get straight A's, once you lose 10 pounds, once you have the hair color of your dreams. That's not when you become lovable to God. There is no future you that you need to become for God to love you then. 
The saints are the ones that realize God loved them right where they were at, as they were. And in catching the love of God as a sailboat catches the wind, they were impelled forth on extravagant missions of love. So the discernment of the love of God, discerning, figuring out God's love, how does God love me here? In the middle of a boring homily at Mass, how does God love me here? In the midst of the chaos of my family, how does God love me here in the midst of a test that's kind of hard? The discernment of the love of God, figuring it out, and which one it is, In God, it's all one love, but for us, we can break it forth into friendship, family loyalty, desire, sacrificial love. And all of that changes us to be able to follow him. So I give you one last piece of homework that no one but you and God will know if you have done. Go back to whatever Lenten resolutions you have. What are you giving up for Lent? Or what are extra, what's something that you're extra doing for Lent? Either you have something or you don't. Either you thought about it beforehand, made it up exactly on Ash Wednesday when someone asked you the the question, or you still don't have anything. If you do have something that you know that you want to do for Lent, ask yourself, is it motivated by love? Do I want to seek to know the familiarities and the complexities of God in this thing that I'm doing or in this thing that I'm giving up? In giving up whatever I'm giving up, does it free me to be able to love God more, to know him more, to seek him more? If it doesn't, you might add a new facet to whatever you're doing or giving up. Because nothing is worth doing unless it's done with love. Go ahead and close your eyes. The quote from the very beginning was this. Nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in a quite absolute and final way. What you are in love with or who you are in love with What seizes your imagination will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, what you will do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love. Stay in love and it will decide everything. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.